أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته and peace be upon you all welcome to the Sharia intelligence course I am your host Muhammad Nuruddin Lemu and with me to discuss today's topic are two of our top facilitators in this course Sister Salatu Sule and Brother Ibrahim Bello السلام عليكم you're both welcome عليكم السلام ورحمة الله the topic we will be looking at today is really comparing the major Sunni schools of law. What exactly is a school of thought? Is it just a school of blind followers? Is it just people who are just doing things that have been handed down? Uh, is it a school that has a methodology? What are the similarities and differences between these schools? What is unique about the schools? And would it be better if we only had one school? I'll start by asking Sister Salatu, what exactly is a madhab? What is a school of thought? A school of thought, a school of juristic thought, is a collection of jurists who have um, the same methodology, the same approach, the same way of executing ijtihad, of applying principles or precepts or rules to context. They have the same consistent I think that's another key thing as well, consistent methodology when it comes to understanding or devising the best way of answering a question, of preferring a solution using text as well as other secondary tools, especially when it comes to secondary tools. Because you wouldn't talk about a school of thought with a methodology of ijtihad if there is no need for ijtihad. These schools evolved over time because of that need to standardize the way in which jurists carry out ijtihad, such that when you have the founder who comes up with an equation, an equation here means a consistent way, a way of ranking the primary sources and using them. Once you have the founder who does that, and then the students who learn from the founder, then they come together. And people who feel more comfortable with a particular methodology then um, attach themselves or identify with that school of um, juristic thought. Another thing when we look at the schools of thought, we have the four Sunni schools, and we know they, were, they originated from the past, but they're still relevant today. Because of that same fact that ijtihad still needs to go on. In fact, one might say ijtihad is more needed now than in centuries past because of how much things have changed from the time of the Prophet wasalam, and the companions after him. It's therefore essential that the methodologies of jurists have a standard that there is a way to follow because we have many people who are passing fatwa and create, carrying out their own ijtihad without the depth of understanding of um, the various fields of the Islamic sciences without that depth of understanding of usul al fiqh or al qawaid al fiqh or al maqasid al sharia, which even though they might have um, positive intents, but they end up sometimes creating misconceptions, complicating issues. So the schools of thought, the madhahib, they actually help with consistency, with um, depth of knowledge, and also with accountability. Because if a scholar or a jurist comes up with a ruling, it's quite easy for someone to just try to find out what school, what method did he follow. And once the person says they follow this particular school or that particular school, let's say the person says he follows the Maliki a method, it's easy for people who understand to know instantly, okay, that's why you have arrived at this, um, this decision. And um, we have the four major ones. Maliki, Hanbali, Shafi, and um, Hanafi. Hanafi, thank you. And then there are others, but I think we'll talk about those more as we go along. Thank you. And Ibrahim, would you add anything there? Yeah, like she said, uh, school of juristic thoughts, uh, schools of uh, scholars whose method has evolved over time and come to be a standard to those particular group of scholars. It's like their own angular perspective of looking at things. It has survived through ages. It has survived hundreds of years, and it has worked fine. It has helped in solving method. It's like a group of thinkers with a consistent uh, methodology, a sort of board mass, 
their own equation of solving problems and methodology of addressing issues. Hundreds of these uh, mujtahid have existed under the same school. Of course, each with its intellectual capacity, but finally, finally, they do melt into the same school. Now, over time, a number of these mazahib existed at the earlier generation, particularly in the second hundred, th third 200 years, between the second century and second century was when these things evolved. And over time, they finally came down to like uh, nine. Actually, there was Mazab of Ibrahim and Nakhai, Mazab of this, Mazab of that. But later, you come to discover that they are too closer to either fold into Maliki or melt into the other one. So, nine survived. And the four major ones are the Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi, and Ahmad bin Hanbal. It is good to note that it was not these scholars that say, this is my mazhab. But rather because of their integrity and their methodology and the vast wisdom of knowledge Allah gave them, and their method, their students develop it to become what it is, and they are called schools of thought. So it becomes in some ways like a survival of the fittest. The best argument survives. Yes. Of course, there were political influences yeah, exactly. that made some exactly. mazhabs. Exactly. Uh, flourish more, yeah. but also those scholars who left more in writing or whose scholars, so whose students wrote things down, articulated their methodologies. And as you said, a lot of these mazhabs, when we read the books of scholars, they cite the opinions of other scholars, yeah. uh, schools that have disappeared, uh, but we will still find books in, on Khilaf like Bidayat al Mujtahid mm. telling us about diversities of. Uh, scholarly opinions on things. But the very important point, uh, Sister Salat, you made that <clears throat> if there was no need for ijtihad, there would be no need for a madhab. Um, that madhabs actually exist to deal with the ni, to deal with presumption. Where the Quran is categorically clear, explicitly clear, Quran, Sunnah, those subjects around ma'alumina deen bid darura, um, there's no need for ijtihad. The text is very explicit there. And so you don't see a difference of opinion uh, between the schools. Uh, An important point you added was the, you know, just hundreds of scholars in each school, uh, scholars of uh, fiqh, mujtahid scholars within a school, but then scholars of tafsir, scholars of Arabic language, scholars of hadith. If you pick one school like, say, the Shafi school, um, you will find Imam al-Nawawi there, you will find Imam al-Ghazali, you will find Ibn Kathir, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, Imam Bukhari himself, Muslim, and a number of others. And so a school of thought is really not just a school of blind followers. It's a school with a diverse qualification of specialists, yeah. but who agree on a methodology when it comes to fiqh, when it comes to law, in representing the Prophet in his absence. And I think this is a very important uh, observation. What would you consider some of the similarities between the various schools, and what would you consider the differences between them? Yeah, that is a good question. Particularly when people come to tell you that the schools of thought are not relevant, or they are sects in a way. They are not. Uh, the, the first similarity is in their objective and the intent. They meant sincerely to represent the Prophet on issues that needed clarification or where the text is silenced. This is one thing we should give them all the excuses. Their goal, their aim was sincere. All of them defended the Quran, they defended the Sunnah. And it's their own angle or paradigm of interpreting the sunnah that finally resulted into that. Number two, we discover that on the fundamentals of religion, we are on the same page. Like ma'alum min ad-din bidarura, the prayer, the things that are haram, with qati subut, qati dilala, yani clear cut, explicit uh, evidence. Nobody say God is true, nobody denies the Prophet of Muhammad the five pillars of Islam, the articles of faith, and most of the things. In fact, we share more in common than our differences. This is what people should understand. Then, even on what we believe, 
should be our source of evidence. Quran first, then Sunnah. All of them share that. Then, even on the Kawaid, the what you can call the maxims, legal maxims, in principle, they all agree to that. Kawaid al fiqhiyya al umuru bima qasidiha. Yeah, and all of that. Similarly, on the higher intents of Sharia, Hifzul Din, Hifzul Nasal, and even much more than that, all of them also agree on the need to have a consistent methodology of solving equation or solving problems. Consistent methodology. All of them agree there should be this consistency. Even though, of course, we are bound to have our differences, but all of them in principle agree with this. So, and a number of other things where you can say, look, we're actually the same. It's just that our own angle of interpretation, and which is naturally in human setup, it is possible. You can't have many intellectuals and always having exactly the same idea. It's not true. They may agree on a method, but the product of their thinking is actually going to be the same. These are the similarities. Then the, the, the differences are, of course, number one, when you start dealing with texts where the meaning is not clear, then you are likely to have more than one interpretation. That is simply what it means. They are not ikhtilafu tadwadud, there are any differences that contradict, but rather what you can say ikhtilaf at various interpretations, all trying to solve one problem. Number two, still related to that. When you start having evidences that they don't consider to be strong enough, like Ahad Hadith and other secondary tools, then their approach and the order will differ. Then, also, when you have uh, issues, uh, they, sometimes the differences are also in their own order of after Quran and Sunnah Mutawatira, what comes first. Of course, if you have these kind of differences, then definitely your product will be different. Different. So, Quran, Sunnah, what comes first? Some other times, it's even in their definition of these technicalities. You know, the simplest terminology is, if you are dealing with Ahlul Hijaz, particularly the Hanbali, wajib is different from rukun. What we call wajib here, to them is like something that is mustahab or sunnah. But in Maliki, when you say wajib, it's no rukun. So they have arkan of salah. You bring it to Maliki Fikhi, they are actually like your faraid of salah. Or how did Hanbali or Hanafi define istihisan? What is the preference or the position Maliki give uh, um, maslaha? So all of them, these are the basis of some of their differences, but they still tolerated one another. So these are the basis of differences. When you have no text, or the text is not explicit, or the order of the strength. Some other times, it's not even that. This evidence to this group is authentic. The other group did not consider it to be authentic. Malik, for instance, will prefer Amal of Medina above even Hadith, even if it is, except as long as it is not Mutawatir. To him, that was fine. He was at home. But many others couldn't see it from his own perspective. So these are some of the causes of these little differences we are seeing, which actually are product of each the hard reasoning and sincere reasoning. But of course, unfortunately, people come to misunderstand it to widen the gap. This is a very important point, the, one, one of the last ones you mentioned, that they, may, they would all accept Quran, they will all accept Hadith, they will all accept Mutawatir Hadith, they also all accept Ahad Hadith. Yes. They just differ in their ranking of which is more authoritative. So as you've mentioned, Malik would consider Amal more authoritative than an Ahad Hadith. Yes. Uh, and so sometimes the diversity of opinions is not because this one knows Hadith and this one doesn't know Hadith. No. Um, after time, I think by the end of the first three centuries or four centuries, Everybody had access to everybody else's hadith. But in spite of that, the mujtahids of the various schools would sometimes still hold on to their opinions, not because they didn't know a hadith, but because of the ranking. They placed the hadith in the order of other tools. 
Um, Sister Salah, what could you add to this issue of similarities and differences? Um, to pick up from that whole question of the tools and how they rank them, ha um, Brother Ibrahim already mentioned the fact that when it comes to the Quran, all the schools accept this as a primary source. When it comes to the Sunnah, they all accept the Sunnah as a primary source, whether it's Mutawatir or Ahad, they all accept this as the primary sources. Another point of divergence comes in when we look at the terminologies. What name do they give a particular tool? So you might find that they would give the same name to a particular tool, but how the tool is used or the function is where you then have divergence. The example has already been given of one, and I would like to add that, for instance, we take istihsan, which we've spent a while, um, some time talking about. For um, someone a scholar like um, Maliki and Hanbali, Istihsan has a much narrower function than you would find for a scholar like um, for, the, for the Hanafi school. Because for the Maliki school and the Hanbali school, Istihsan is separate, it's articulated and separated from Masolehul uh, Mursala and Swadul Zariya. Whereas in the Hanafi school, it's taken that what these others called Istihsan, Masolih, Mursala, and Swadu Dariya all fall under Istihsan. It's all juristic discretion. So you hear the same term, but the function is different. Broad in Hanafi, under Hanafi school, narrower under Hanbali and Maliki school, because they have other tools that fill in those um, extra areas. Another point of difference is where you have different terminologies but essentially still performing the same function. So for so, in some schools, when they say urf, some other schools will say, well, that's istishab. And for that reason, you might hear different terminologies, but the function is the same. One thing that's um, worthy of note is the differences that exist between these schools, that diversity, has actually helped in certain ways. For instance, it has helped with what people, what people would call these days perspective taking, where I have my perspective on what works, what is the best way to do something, but by becoming aware that somebody else has actually devised another method, and knowing that method, I begin to understand and appreciate ways in which my method may not be the most um, appropriate for a particular context or a particular issue. So there's that greater appreciation of the works of others. Another thing that the diversity has given rise to is a, a richer and a wider toolbox where people from one school, scholars from one school, can look at what someone else has done in a particular field and then decide that, okay, for the purpose of this thing or this matter, or this issue, we would adopt this approach what's known as Talfik, we would adopt this approach. And you see that happening a lot, lot in the part of, in the area of Islamic finance, where the particular methodologies, approaches adopted by Hanafi has made the Hanafi approach much more suitable for Islamic finance. So you now have scholars, especially in the last, um, in the more recent times when Islamic finance is gaining ground and more scholars need to make certain decisions around that. So you have scholars from other schools adopting the Hanafi approach. So we find that the similarities are there, the differences are also there, but the differences are now given birth to more advantages for the scholars and for the fields generally of um, Ijtihad. This is, this is very interesting. And I think the point you touched on um, about their diversity and how another perspective from another school allows you to actually see what you thought just was one way of looking at things. There's actually an, a legitimate alternative way of looking at the same text or the same evidence or the same problem um, where they now are able to recognize and have the intellectual humility to admit that another school has solved this problem better than our school and they borrow from each other uh, using what is called talfiq. Could we look into also what is unique about each school? Before we look into, you know, would it have been better if we only had one? I'd like to start by asking 
um, what's unique about each school? I know most schools, for example, they all accept Quran and Sunnah. They all accept Ijma, at least in principle. They may differ in their definitions. They all accept Qiyas. They may differ in the authority they give it. They all accept Ra'i of Sahaba. They differ in how much authority they give. They all accept Istishab. They would differ. Uh, but in principle, they have some of those basic tools in common. What are those things that make each school unique? Sister Sarah. Okay. I think here it would be useful to just do a quick run through of, um, let's say, the first five tools that each school holds based on their ranking after we've looked at Quran and Sunnah Mutawati. We'll start with the oldest school, Hanafi school. After Quran and Sunnah Mutawati, the tool that they consider the highest ranking that they give the most weight. This is where they're now going to each they had. That is a more juristic reasoning, cognitive um, exploration. Is this the sun juristic preference? So they bring that first before everything else. And this is why it said that they have been able to adapt faster to the field of Islamic finance. Because with juristic discretion or preference, it's the jurist looking at the context, the situation, looking at the available tools, the rulings, and also being able to pull in, what do the experts say on this? So it allows a great deal of adaptability and flexibility. And the jurist, um, when the jurist is, is using his tesan, is not tied to text. So there's that freedom that's given. So they bring that forth, then Qiyas, then Ijma, then Sunan, Sunan Ahad, so we see that even though the, in the Hanafi school, Sunnah Ahad is looked at as a primary source, Ahad Hadith. However, what weight it's given is, we would say, three steps in or so. After that, then you would, they would take the um, opinion of the companion, Rai Asahabi. We go to the next school, Maliki. After Quran and Sunnah Mutawatir, Maliki then, the Maliki scholar would then look at Amal, of the people of Medina, Amal Ahl Medina, those those um scholars from the first two generations after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that would be their first reference. After that, then you look at um, Maswali Hul Mursala. Then Qiyas, Sunan Ahad, and Roy of Sahabi. So again, we see Sunan Ahad, Ahad Hadith, coming a bit further down the ladder in the terms of ranking. For Shafi'i school, after Quran and um, hadith. the first thing they would then take is ijma. So they would look at the consensus of scholars. Then Sunnah Ahad, Rai Sahabi, Istishab, and Qiyas. So they actually look at Istishab as one of the first five tools that they would employ. For the other schools, Istishab comes in, a, comes in a bit later on. But they then bring in all those presumptions we talked about where we say this is actually the foundation for discussing any matter, particularly um, when we are looking at Mu'amalat, where you just say there are some presumptions that are fixed and they don't shift. And it's anybody who is claiming anything to the contrary who would then bear the burden of proof. So this is where you might find that when you use this approach of the Shafi'i school, you might be able to tap into those presumptions and have a solid foundation for starting of a discussion that does not place unnecessary burden on people. Then we look at the Hanbali school. After Quran and Mutawatir Hadith, they immediately go to Ahad Hadith. So they give Ahad Hadith more weight than other schools do. After that, then they would look at the opinion of the companions, then Ijma, then Riyas, then Maslaha. Then we have another school that is, it's worth mentioning here, the Zahiri school. They have a simpler, I once used the word a simpler approach because I was looking at it from the point of view of a student trying to remember what is the equation. And then my learned Sheikh said, well, it is simpler, but sometimes it means they don't have the advantage of some of these other um, tools. That is, it's Quran for them, Sunnah Mutawatir, and then Istishab. Sunnah Ahad and then Istishab. Sunnah Ahad, sorry, and mm. then Istishab. So these are, this is an outline of the first five tools. There are other tools that follow in the other four Sunni schools, but 
just by looking at the equation you will start you would start to see why for certain issues one particular methodology might actually work better than another and why um, lay people would sometimes end up being totally confused that why are the scholars not agreeing on the same thing but the understanding of this equation actually helps thank you so much uh, Ibrahim what would you add yeah in addition to what she has said you discovered that uh, Maliki accepted nearly all the tools he has more tools in his toolbox mm. followed by Hambali um, Shafi'i and uh, Ahmad gave more preference to Hadith Ahad compared to Malik. Uh, Hanafi, on the other hand, gave a higher preference to Istihsan. Then all of them differ with Malik regarding Ijma of people of Medina. They say that belongs to you alone. You know, they would prefer to have Ijma with Sahaba or Ijma with Ahlul Kufa or whatever. Nobody like want to take that from him. But of course, he is convinced on why he is using it. Then, aside that, uh, they differ on the nitty gritty of how they apply some of these tools. Like we said earlier, the technicalities used by Shafi'i a little different from the technicalities used to define some things by Hanbali. To Shafi'i, Istis Hab is of great importance. To, to Hanafi, no, it's his son. But when you look at them from different, to Malik, no, Maslaha. So these are some of the differences uh, among them. Then you have another group that is like, uh, just to know, like the Jafari Mazhab, the Zaidi, and uh, all of that. The, like the Zahiri, for instance, Zahiri has accepted nothing except just four. Quran, actually one of the new tools to him Quran Sunnah Sunnah is Sunnah whatever type of Sunnah and after oh, that oh, is, is this hub and that's all then the Ahlul Bayt the Zahiri they rejected most things including Rahi Sahaba but they come up with what I call yani, Ijma Ahab of Ahlul Bayt so these are some of the peculiarities with each of them very interesting but as you've mentioned even with the Zahiri uh, just with the, uh, you know, with the Zahiri, which is also viewed as a Sunni uh, school, though now more within academic circles than anywhere else. Um, we do have the Ibadis, we have the Ja'fari, who are mainly Shia, we have the Zaidi, who are also Shia, but probably closer yeah, uh, to between. the Sunni. Uh, something they all have in common is accepting Qur'an and Hadith Mutawatir before anything else. Yes. Um, uh, and because of that, we all share the same ma'alum min ad deen bid -daura, those most fundamental aspects of the deen. Uh, and that is why uh, nobody has prevented them from going for Hajj. Uh, we treat them uh, as Muslims and vice versa, at least for the majority. And what we also find within the Sunni schools, at least, but goes also across, but uh, since our main focus is on the four, uh, no one has felt there's the need to do da'wah to convert a Maliki to a Hanafi, or to convert a Hanbali to a Shafi, or to convert, it was, there was this agreement to respect the diversity, to acknowledge that your methodology of representing the Prophet is a valid methodology. And while we may disagree, we also recognize, as Imam Shafi would sometimes say, I believe the other opinion is wrong with the possibility that it is right and my opinion is wrong. You know? yeah. So you had that intellectual humility among the great Imams of all these schools. A similar statement is also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, attributed to Imam Abu Hanifa um, of that respect for others. But I think it has also helped each one of them when anyone gets into an ijtihad jam, like a traffic jam, or is stuck on an issue, we find they have always been able to import an opinion that they regard as valid into their own school. And so this going beyond just tolerating the difference to respecting the difference 
and appreciating the difference, which takes me to uh, the last question I'd want to ask, Brother Ibrahim. In view of this diversity of the various schools, would it have been better if we just had one? I and mean, then we had hundreds of schools. Probably that's a big exaggeration. Um, but when it comes to mujtahids, um, we have had some put over 150, some put probably up to 200 or more mujtahid imams within the Muslim Ummah, of course, all belonging to various schools. Um, fine, we've got within the Sunni world four main ones. Would it have been better if we really just had one or if we have one as we move into the future? Oh, really? Interesting. It's, it's not just about, it's not a different Islam per se. So there are not people outside Islam. So we are not preaching more than one religion that you said, that you actually would need to get somebody or convert them. It's about which room in the house of Islam. We're all, in, we're all Muslims. And because of this kind of allegation and criticism, Ibn Taymiyyah wrote a book he called Raf ul Malam Anil Aimmat al Alam. Meaning, let, let me, let, don't criticize these key scholars of the Ummah or leaders of Mazahib. And he gave a reason for varying differences. The number one, it is worth to know that mistake and differences don't come from the prophets. It actually comes from the scholars, if at all you have, because of Ishtihad, that they were sincere. And other reasons we have mentioned. So having more mazahib, more schools of thought, is like having, more, number one, this is like having a, a, a toolbox. If you have a mechanic or a carpenter or a builder, the more toolbox you have, tools you have in your box, the better your chances of doing better than the other person. Two, this vast majority of tools and each jihad and fatwas that emanated from scholars that live in different time at different places over the history actually help us in solving problems and having variety of choices when we are faced with different contexts. So it's not like something new. Like anybody that studies wide can see the limitation of Maliki Mazhab, can see the limitation of this, can see the limitation of this. But you can also appreciate what we get from all of them. This is the interesting thing. And that's why at their own time, they respected each other and they considered these things valid as normal. The only mistake we make is when we fail to differentiate between what is divine and what is actually a product of their own ijtihad some of which are likely tied to their context. But as long as we have this at the bottom line, we are fine. More so, it is worth noting that each of them excel in one area or made more contribution in one area than the other. Abu Hanifa did more on Kawaii fiqih here. And Islamic finance, a number of new contemporary issues, Hanafi Mazhab seems to be like they are ahead. When it comes to Maslaha, the fiqhu of Salat and Tahara, a number of that, if you study and get it right in Maliki, you are ahead of any other person wherever you go in the world. You can always see the loopholes and shortcomings. Shafi did more on Usul al fiqh, the fiqhu of fasting, and some other areas. Hanbali did much more on Hajj, and a lot of things more on Hadith and the Sahaba's life and what have you. So everybody has got its own contribution. So it's not a matter, a matter of have one mazhab and we solve the problem. It's about angle and perspective. In fact, if you denounce all, the, 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 ch the chances are you actually forming a new one to make the fifth one. Because you can't just understand the basics and tenets of Islam without going through this methodology. There is nothing like, I'll do it directly on my own, I don't need it. It's not true, it's not possible. This is very interesting, where you are presenting the madhabs as complementary. Yes. Um, that actually we would be worse off without any one of them. Yes. And each should recognize the benefit of the other, and that it's all within the house of Islam. It's different perspectives to also recognize the scholars and scholarship. Nearly every every great scholar throughout Islamic history was either a mujtahid 
or someone who belonged to an existing madhab. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so to say, forget the madhabs is like saying forget about a methodology. Yes. Now, just to add. Yes, please. Even even when you can see some scholars dissenting from their madhab, it's just advancement in some level of knowledge, and that further proved to us that those things were just ijtihad. But it's not that like some people say, "Ibn Taymiyyah a challenge and what have you." Yeah, he still he still he belongs. Imam Buhari, some people tell you he doesn't have mazhab. It's not true. He went through a methodology. So it's not about rebelling against the mazhab. No single scholar attend a scholarship without going through method. It's like saying you have a degree without going through formal educational system. I don't know which institution and who awarded you that. Sister Salah, what would you add? Yes, I would like to say that when one looks at the diversity that exists within the madhabs, as Mala Ibrahim rightly said, that itself is not a problem. It's when maybe people don't understand what led to the divergence in opinion between the madhab, and people have not yet appreciated how diversity is in itself an advantage. When we look at how the different madhabs came up, it was Mujtahid trying to solve problems. When we look at the timeline of the, um, we would say the, the founders, so they didn't really found the, um, establish it as such, but let's just say the founders. They lived at sometimes overlapping times, but each person had that space within history where they occupied. And they were responding to what they saw going on, what they were experiencing, the issues coming before them. So over time, as these different methodologies were refined and evolved to what we have today, what I think is worth taking or learning from that is the fact that the human mind has been divinely designed to look for solutions to problems and to explore those problems. The fact that even within the each madhab, you would see variations, divergence of opinion, tells us that these madhabs were not meant to be um, a place where people just follow blindly. They were actually places meant to refine and improve critical thinking and scholarship and the art of each they had. So the lesson from them would be for people to open their minds more and look for higher levels of thinking or think much more critically, even if one doesn't have the advantage of studying a particular uh, methodology, but to go away from, with that lesson. Because the scholars themselves, the well-versed scholars, appreciate that diversity now. They appreciate it now, and they did even then. And they learned from one another. And before they would um, critique a person's, another scholar's opinion, or say, OK, no, I don't want, I won't go with that method, I'll go with mine, they would first study that one and understand it. Essentially, I think it's all about respecting um, diversity, when diversity is rooted in good intentions, when diversity is rooted in the intention to create accrue benefit and prevent harm. This is very interesting. And um, I think, firstly, as you've put it, the diversity actually gave greater flexibility. I think at the back of our minds to remember also that every time scholars differ, you are observing critical thinking, independent thinking going on. Uh, which is a characteristic of every field of human endeavor where reasoning is trying to solve problems. You can't bring consultant economists and say, what is the solution for our problem in Nigeria or security? Get experts in security, get experts in education, get experts in medicine. Everybody has their own area of what they feel would be the way forward. Uh, doctors will differ on the diagnosis and the prescription of a particular patient. So, uh, but it's that conversation, that recognizing uh, the importance that each is trying to represent the prophet in his absence. Um, each has something to offer. Each has an angle that would benefit the other. But probably as we move into a more faster paced world, a more globalized, uncertain, volatile, uh, complex. complex future that we are living in, um, we find in the tools of ijtihad 
those tools that are most um, adept, those tools that are most appropriate for rapid change and diversity uh, coming to the fore. And so while Quran and Sunnah will, for, uh, you know, will always be relevant, we are finding things like Ijma, while it's useful on a number of topics, becoming uh, less visible in contemporary ijtihad. The Ra'i of Sahaba becoming less visible in contemporary ijtihad. Amal Ahl al Madina becoming less visible in contemporary ijtihad. Uh, but we see more istishab, uh, legal presumption. We see more maslaha. We see more istihsan. We see more saddu zariya uh, and more application of the kawaid and maqasid uh, coming in. And so, in a sense, the times we live in are creating a convergence. Uh, we find even globally very similar fatwas being given to the same thing. So unlike in the past where you will find on one issue there are up to 13 differences of opinion or nine differences of opinion even within the Hanbali school on a particular issue, uh, we find with, the, with contemporary realities the earth getting, as some would put it, more flat. You know, we're facing similar challenges uh, even though there's diversity. I think something important to end on the recognition that these legal schools of thought or schools of law are schools of thought. They are schools with a methodology. They are not schools of blind following. They are not copy pasting from one generation to another. The recognition that just as we have diversity between schools, we have diversity within schools, that the critical thinking was not just we only follow our own, but even within you will find dissenting voices the recognition, as you mentioned earlier, that, the, uh, that without ijtihad or the need for ijtihad, we would have no need for a methodology of representing the Prophet where there was ambiguity. That the existence of dhanni in the Quran and in the Hadith, and there will always be those texts that are not categorically clear, and their application to reality would require ijtihad, would require juristic reasoning, would require extra evidence to bolster and support specific arguments. So we will always have to live with that diversity, but the need to appreciate its benefit, just as it was in the past, and to live with it, as is the diversity in every other field. And I would probably uh, want to underscore a point both of you started with, this recognition of the ma'alum min ad deen bid darura that recognition of the most essential parts of Islam that are explicitly clear in the Quran and in the Sunnah Mutawatir, that is the common denominator for all Muslims. What makes us Muslims? You can reject this ijtihad for another ijtihad, you are still a Muslim. Um, the only thing that takes you out of Islam is if you reject any of those fundamental essentials called the ma'alum in ad-deen bid-darura. Uh, all ijtihad is dhanni, there's a level of presumption and speculation, a margin of human error possible, and the need for us to just, you know, chill, to, to calm down when there's diversity of opinion among scholars on these other issues. It's not new, it'll never stop, um, ijtihad will always continue, and we will always have diversity, as is the case in every field, but the need to keep brotherhood at the centre that what we have in common is both more important, more significant, a greater priority than the diversity of opinions on other issues that are less important. Uh, and the need for us to just learn more and more, to learn to agree, to disagree agreeably, <laughs> to, to recognize the straight path is wide enough for diversity. But once you have accepted the ma'alum in the deen bid darura, that is the most essential thing so whether you're a little to the right, to the left in ijtihad, uh, we say others may be wrong with the possibility that they are right and we think we are right with the possibility that we may be wrong. And I guess as a, a scholar said, for every scholar, view a scholar as being like a tree that bears fruit. You would find some fruit are ripe and benefit from that. Some fruit are raw, not yet ripe, because the scholar is also a student of knowledge. And some fruit are not good, they are spoiled. Uh, mm. They belong for, to another time, another context. But you don't cut down the tree just because you don't like some of the fruit or it's sour to you. 
Uh, we pray Allah to continue to guide us all, to bless our scholars and teachers, to mm-hmm. forgive us where we have made mistakes. And uh, inshallah, we will stop here. I'd like to thank you both for your contributions. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.